Hello brothers and sisters, this is Apostle George in a special broadcast on Facebook Live to signify or to mark the Resurrection Day. Uh, one of the things you've taken note about our commission, the Lord told us not to do things with the religious world because what the religious world has done over the years is to corrupt the message of the gospel and in the process it has taking away the cutting edge of the gospel. And that's why we don't use the name Easter because there's no need to use a name that is jaded, a name that is corrupted with so many connotations. We use the proper word Resurrection Day. And that's what today is. We're just marking the resurrection of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach who came in the flesh, who came from heaven, very Elohim, very man, who gave his life for us at the cross and who rose again the third day <clears throat> so brothers and sisters the resurrection is a very powerful and critical thing to celebrate because it's actually a bill of freedom in the real sense because the entire incarnation the entire life ministry of yeshua the entire passion suffering and death would have been incomplete if he didn't rise from the dead. He didn't come to come and stay with us permanently. His mission on earth was just at three and a half years, telling us that it's not how long one lives, but how well you complete your assignment. And at the end of it, the Father, by his Spirit, ensured that he arose from the dead, as we're told in the book of Romans. The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And then the angels quickened, you know, the angels rolled away the stone. The earthquake happened. And we need to appreciate what the Lord has for us. Yesterday we looked at John's account. And by the grace of the Lord, we saw some awesome things that were there. And I think I'd like to repeat them again because it's so important for us. John 20, the first day of the week met Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and see the stone taken away from the sepulchre and she ran it and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Yeshua loved and said unto them they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we don't know where they've led him Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple came to the sepulchre so they ran both together the disciple came out ran Peter came to the sepulchre, he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloth lying, he went yet not in. Then came Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre and see the linen clothes. You see, that was real honest account. John outran Peter, but he didn't enter. Peter came and went across and went into the sepulchre, and then they saw. But then something interesting happened. We are told that the napkin was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place of itself. Then went in that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. It's so beautiful, the honesty with which John wrote what happened, that not only did they miss it, he talked about how they missed it even. How they missed being the first to see him because they didn't endure. They didn't endure the grave. They went home. We said this yesterday and it bears repeating. There is a real chance for us to understand something very real. And that is the best of Elohim belongs to those who sustain whatever the Lord gives to them to the end. That's why we're told you know, to be steadfast and unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, because the resurrection account tells us how these two close disciples of Yeshua, they were there. They got there. They didn't see him. They went home. Verse 11, but Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. And as she wept, she stood down. And looked into the sepulchre. Mary had expectation. Mary's passion and devotion. You know this woman was. Much was forgiving her. So much was forgiving her. And she tarried. 
because much was forgiven her, she also loved much. And that love endured till the end. And that love secured for her a place as the first evangelist, the first person to proclaim the good news that mission has been accomplished. Now, which so the account that she had with the angels, she sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Yeshua had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've taken him, where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Yeshua study and knew not it was him. You know, the devotion was heavy. She didn't know where they'd taken the body. And she didn't want any abuse on the body. Her devotion was persisted even unto death. She was still standing rock solid. And then we're told that in verse 16, Yeshua said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Yeshua said unto him, unto her, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I have sent to my father, and to your father, to my Elohim, and your Elohim. Very powerful scripture we mentioned yesterday, and it bears repeating that here in this place, Yeshua announced a transition that was occurring in the spirit, that from being servants, and he made them friends in John 15, verse 15. And now from being friends, he made them sons. Sons of Elohim. Because part of what Yeshua came to do, we've told you before, he didn't come to establish a religion called Christianity. That is a narrative religion has fostered on the world since the 4th century. And that's why the church is powerless. The church is the building. The church is the organization people go into. Because Christianity and its latter variant called churchianity, church, is what it's all about. What you do in the building. The rituals you do in the building on certain holy days. That's what they've turned it. But Yeshua came to do something more profound. He came to restore that which was lost when Adam and Eve fell. Adam was created as a son of Elohim. He was created in the image of Yahweh as his father. He was created with all authority and power. His wisdom was awesome. He named all animals. Yet he lost it all due to sin. Him and Eve. And that loss, all the years, Israel had tried various forms of religion to assess Elohim. The best they could do was to kill an animal, to atone or stand for a sin. And it couldn't go further. In the fullness of time, Elohim allowed Yeshua to be incarnated in the earth. And incarnation simply means he dropped his glory and came. He put it aside for a little season. So that in the human form, he could take all our sins upon him. He could feel what we feel. And he could go to the cross to, to prove that he was divine. He was God made flesh. He went to the cross and told the people before he went to the cross that I'll stay there. This is a sign. When they were asking for a sign, he said the ultimate sign is the sign of the resurrection. That is what you know, that I am to live from heaven and I'm going back to heaven. And after three days, I'll be, he said, I'll be killed. And after three days, I'll be crucified. After three days, I'll rise again from the dead. So by the grace of the Lord, the resurrection was fulfillment of what he said. It was fulfillment of prophecies that were given from the time of David. Psalm 16 and other places, David spoke about that. Brothers and sisters, it is so important we realize that he didn't come for any other thing than to bring sonship to humans. And sonship means we can grow from whatever level of relationships. And of course, listen to this, churchianity, the highest it can do to you is to give you the negative relationship types. To make you a perpetual babe who goes to receive a sop, milk from a leader who knows Elohim and you don't know him and he's your mediator with Elohim. The best Christianity does is to make people, you know, you know, unwilling slaves who walk afar from Elohim. No real personal relationship. The best religion can do 
is to make people to stay in arrested babyhood syndrome. The best he can do is to make people serve a distant unknown God. But Yeshua came to take away the middle wall of partition between Elohim and man. He came to bring us into that state of sonship, which he demonstrated. How did he demonstrate it? He didn't live for his own self. He submitted his will to the Father. He said, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's a son indeed. And the Father is looking for such. So if you celebrate the re resurrection, it's good to celebrate. But it's better to understand what the resurrection has meant to you. What it has done to you. What the Father accomplished at the resurrection by raising him from the dead. And that is why it's important to also know the resurrection paved the way for two major things. One of them was for his ascension bodily to heaven. So that in the court of heaven, sits one who has borne flesh and blood. One who can empathize with us. Whatever you are going through, you are being tempted. He, has, he was tempted. The devil tempted him. You are going through a crisis. He's gone, he went through a crisis. You have issues with food. You have issues with what to eat and all that. He, he was an hungered. We saw that. The day he caused the fig tree, he was hungry. He had nowhere to lay his head. He said, birds have nests. Foxes have holes. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So if you are homeless, he has been homeless. He has experienced whatever we experience. The father didn't bring him to come and do a cosmetic work. He came. That's why he bought flesh and blood for those 33 and a half years. So he can feel whatever we feel. And at the end of it, he was crucified. But three days later, he rose. Those who went to look for him, they went to look for the living in the place of the dead. That's the what religion is doing. Religion wants to organize a perpetual memorial service for him, remembering him on the cross, hanging. And as I told you, there are two motives of religion that are powerful in their negative sense to celebrate a bad day for him, reminding him, looking at him as a babe in a manger, and then to celebrate a memorial service as if he didn't complete his mission memorial. So when you have in your mind, you are fixed upon Yeshua as a babe in a manger and also as a man hanging helpless on a tree, you are not able to submit to his lordship. You are not able to surrender all to him. Give him all. You are not able to do that. If truly all you see of him is a babe in a manger in December, and a helpless man on a tree around April, you will not submit to him. But supposing you see him like John saw him, the glorified Yeshua, blessing with glory, his hair, his eyes, you know, his eyes were piercing, his feet like burnished brass. You see him, how he is in his glorified state, which is a fruit of the resurrection. If you can allow your entire senses to wrap around the picture of the glorified Yeshua, the truth is that you fall at his feet like John fell, you submit to his lordship, you hand you all authority in heaven, he, which he told them on the resurrection day, as he said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me, because it was mission accomplished. He was lord in heaven. He came to earth, and by in the flesh, he overcame Satan, the God of this world. So he became Lord on earth, and he died, and as he died, he also went to, to take away all authority and power that Satan possesses in hell, in the realm of hell, so that he could be Lord of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth, in all realms of existence. And that is one that is our Yeshua. That is the one that is our Lord. That's why we need to submit to his sovereign rule. To celebrate the resurrection. No wonder they just prefer to use the name Easter. Easter. To, to really understand the resurrection and not submit to his authority is contradictory. Because he resurrected to be Lord over all. And brothers and sisters, I want to say to you the greatest thing you can do today, if you've not done it, is to consciously and intentionally give up lordship of yourself, that lordship that is your own self-nature, that rules what you want, and yourself is the center of your life. 
you are the, the, yourself is the center nature and circumference of your life that today if you will intentionally realize that look you've made bad choices you've not gone far you serve the lord when it's convenient for you and you surrender all you bring yourself everything in you your ego your personality everything your achievements in life you take them all and lay it at his feet that if one to any elders you take your crowns and place at his feet and say i surrender take over my life you rule you reign and become his disciples indeed the resurrection calls for discipleship the resurrection calls for not just accept him as savior who came to save you from your sin but to also embrace him as lord and king so that he now sits in the throne of my heart, throne of your heart. I no longer live for myself. I no longer do whatever I like. I no longer go wherever I like. I allow him to determine what to do. So he begins to have first charge on my time. First charge on the money he gives to me is not my money. It's his money. So I'm a steward of his money. I'm a steward of life. The life is not my own. He gave it to me. The time is not my own. He gave it to me. And then I become a steward. Men and brethren, when we enthrone him as Lord, we are affirming his sovereignty. We are affirming that truly we believe in the resurrection. So to do any celebration and do rituals and, and chant some verses and chant some songs and at the end, you're still Lord of yourself. You are saying he didn't resurrect. That's why religion is so deadly. Religion offers a placebo to people. The songs, the pipe songs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then they do all this procession and all those things, all those colors and all those carnal things. At the end of the day, people carry their sin, go into a church, do rituals for two hours, one hour, come out again, and they switch back to their life, just sanctimonious for the time of service. And even from there, iniquity just kept at bay for one or two hours, what use is it? If we sin willfully, if sin rules the life of somebody, the resurrection was not believed in. Because if you believe in the resurrection, you know that he has the power to deliver from the grip of sin, the power to deliver from the grip of Satan, the power to give us the abundant life, the life that is lived in his pleasure. The life that is lived submitted to his will. The life that is lived in which he is the essential factor. He is the driver who is steering the wheel of our life. That's what the resurrection calls for. Then also, men and brethren, the resurrection not only paved the way for him to ascend to heaven, it also paved the way for the next big event, which is the outpouring of Holy Spirit. Because he arose and finished his assignment, went to the Father, and the courts of heaven, they saw mission accomplished. The next thing was to release Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, there's a dynamic that we need to bear in mind. It's such a powerful dynamic that the Godhead, Elohim, the way he's worked with humans, it's so interesting. The narrative of the Bible, because in the Old Covenant, you saw it from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Israel after them. Essentially, they saw Yahweh. And they walked with Yahweh. And they revered Yahweh. And they tried to reach Yahweh from afar off, apart from people like Moses that saw him at the burning bush, apart from people that had him like Moses. He spoke to Moses face to face. He called Moses to the mountain. He communed with him. And Abraham saw him. He related with him. He called him his friend. But essentially, the Old Testament, they served him from afar. Because the veil was upon Moses. And that veil has not been taken away because also... They chose to use Moses as a step-down transformer that led to the old priesthood paradigm. Because when Moses came down, his face shining from the mountain, oh, they said, no, no, we can't stand his glory. They couldn't sound the sound of his voice, the thundering of his voice, the mountains that were on fire. At Horeb, they couldn't stand it. And they said, oh, no, 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 this is too awesome, Moses. Why not let him speak to you? And then you speak to us. That's how the Old Testament priesthood became a one 
of intermediation between a holy Elohim and an unholy people. But brothers and sisters, I want you to take note of this. In the fullness of time, Elohim chose to break that middle wall of partition and come and dwell among men, and that was achieved in the form of Emmanuel, Elohim with us. And so, the fathers remained at the throne of grace, and essentially Yeshua, the Son, came for 33 and a half years to dwell among us in the planet Earth, carry a Jewish body, ate food, drank, slept, rested. Wow! Internet related with people had excellent relationship with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and um, Martha. Ate in the house of Simon the leper, did all kinds of things that were real and human. Elohim dwelt amongst us physically, yet he came to his own. His own received him not. His own rejected him. The religious leaders asked Rome. They told the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, they preferred a murderer. They preferred an evil person to be released to them. They preferred that over Yeshua, the righteous. They didn't recognize him. The veil of Moses covered them. And men and brethren, so he finished his assignment only few. As a matter of fact, at the end of the day, 500 saw him the day he rose from the dead. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but out of those 500, only 120 obeyed him. He said, don't go for me. Don't go. I am sending you to the kingdoms of this world where they have principalities as their leader. Principalities rule their leaders. Principalities rule the land. So I don't want you to go as weaklings. Wait for the promise of the Father. You know what? 380 did not obey. They went to preach a half gospel, an incomplete gospel. It was 120 that stayed on the upper room until the door of Pentecost in Acts 2. And when they were, you know, in one accord, in one place, the Holy Spirit came whoosh, filled up the place, filled them up. And the third dispensation of Elohim's dealing with man began. The first one, Yahweh, relating with Israel alone. They were his chosen people. Others were Gentiles. The second dispensation, Yahweh, um, uh, Elohim manifesting as Yeshua to dwell among men, the dispensation where the Son was essentially on earth amongst people and those who encountered him, most of them did not recognize him, did not submit to him, but when he finished his assignment and rose again, which was mission accomplished, and went to sit in the heavenlies, Holy Spirit now became the factor among the triune Elohim that was now to come to do a work. Why was it necessary? It was necessary because, listen to this, Yeshua in his epic conversation with the disciples from John 14, 15, and 16, he was telling them something about his going to die. And they were feeling very, very uncomfortable. They were feeling sad and sorrowful. He said, well, you are, you are known. You don't know why what you are, are, are trying to uh, uh, basically reject. He says, I'm with you here. Where I am, that's where you are. I do miracles. I do signs. I do wonders. I break bread. I multiply it. You eat. But if I go away, then will be sent to you to come and be in you, within you, the third person in the Godhead. And because he is spirit, anywhere, anyone who believes in me is, is there to empower. Anywhere you go is there to show up through you. And look at the glorious picture. So Holy Spirit will now come to, just as Yeshua was Elohim made flesh, so has Holy Spirit be given so that through him in us, we can walk in a measure of divinity because he lives in us. Because of the spiritual gifts he puts in us, whenever those spiritual gifts come out, whether it's teaching like I'm teaching you now, if this teaching opens your eyes, I minister to you because spiritual gift is expression 
or what is impressed into us. Why? Because of Holy Spirit now working amongst us. In other words, the resurrection paved the way for the third dispensation of Elohim's dealings with humanity. The dispensation where Holy Spirit will be poured out to all who believe. And the question therefore is, have you received Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you known him? Do you commune with him? Have you received his gifts and callings? Or are you mere church goer? Are you mere statistics on a church register? You are mere statistics on a church register. Are you walking in your old abilities, in your old strengths? Or are you walking in the glory of the gift of Holy Spirit and the power thereof through which you are able to enjoy all that you ordained for you. And I want to say this to you. That third dispensation is a dispensation that will take humanity to the end of the age. Where he is our objective life. And he is awesome in our midst. That through him, anywhere we are, divinity can show up. Every time spiritual gift is manifested, divinity has shown up. Because spiritual gift is not our own. It is him using us to show up. And so, men and brethren, the resurrection paved the way for Holy Spirit to come into the atrium to dwell inside humans. And if you have not received him, if you have not embraced that reality, then you need to do something about it. He arose. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. But is that all you pack? Something is wrong. He arose. That the life gate will be open for us to live the Elohim life, the Zoe life in the earth ring. And we cannot live it except by the power of Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, men and brethren. I want to encourage you to come to the place where you can embrace the wholesome truth of the resurrection. That this gift that Father poured out on planet Earth on the day of Pentecost, all the 120 who obeyed him and were staying in the upper room, all of them, all without any exclusion, older people who are approaching middle age like Peter, younger people, people like John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, he was a teenager at this time, men and women. If you look at Acts chapter 1, it tells you the profile. And then Acts 2 tells you the actual act. In other words, men and brethren, the resurrection paved the way for that dispensation where Elohim indwelled those who received the ministry of the blood that Yeshua shed. And I want to encourage you, wherever you may be, come to that place of being open, yearn for, yearn for, press in, study all you can on Holy Spirit, and really talk to the Lord and say, Lord, if it is so, then, then what's the use my just going to church as in a building when you, Elohim, want to make me your church, me your residence, me your dwelling, me your sanctuary? This is a glorious privilege. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is asking us to ignore all the, you know, all the things we see, the misuse of Holy Spirit among, especially those who are Pentecostal background and all the noise making and all that. He wants us to embrace the real deal. The fullness of the real deal, which is that God, just as Elohim was in us, was with us in Yeshua. He wants to be with us through Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And when the Holy Spirit dwells, he becomes he restrained us from having a desire for anything sinful and evil. We're able to love righteousness and hate iniquity. And then our vessels are available for him to show up big time anywhere the Father wants. Anytime the Father wants. And then he can use us to do signs and wonders, miracles. He can use us to bring healing to those who are afflicted by COVID-19. He can use us to send forth his word anywhere. And he can, of course, he will, of course, empower us in our prayer. That's why we want to thank the Lord for everyone who has volunteered to be part of the 24-7 uh, uh, Global Prayer Task Force to degrade and eliminate coronavirus on Facebook as well as on the 24-7 prayer line. I pray that the Lord is going to empower everyone with a fresh measure. There's one thing else I want to say about Holy Spirit. It's not just about, uh, uh, I received Holy Spirit 20 years ago, 15 years ago. That's not enough. There's something called refilling. 
And the acts of the apostle, he revealed people from time to time when they yearned for, when they prayed, when they were pressed on at the wall. Now that COVID-19 has pressed the church against the wall, this is the greatest time to really travel in prayer for an outpouring of Holy Spirit. So I want to pray that by Pentecost Sunday, 50 days from today, we will not just rejoice and have thanksgiving worldwide, a whole lot of people who never have received Holy Spirit or who were dry, they've received Holy Spirit, but they've been dry. By Pentecost Sunday, there'll be celebration, massive celebration that COVID-19 has been degraded and eliminated and that, oh, many saints are now walking in the fullness of the power. Starting from today, press in. Starting from today, Travel. You can receive Holy Spirit in your kitchen, in your living room, in your bedroom, anywhere, on the hallway, not just inside building, not just in revival services, not just when hands are laid. Of course, you receive by hands being laid. There's also spontaneous infilling. And the Lord is saying, when we begin to be open to this, then truly the resurrection has made meaning for us individually. Because the resurrection was to pave the way for him to go to the throne of grace and from there receive of the Father and shed abroad the power of Holy Spirit. And that's my prayer for the church of Yeshua. That the church of Yeshua will walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And there's something they said of Barnabas. He was a man who was full of Holy Spirit. He wasn't just filled, he was full. Meaning his whole vessel was under the total control of Holy Spirit. Remember he said in Matthew, we're told in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by Holy Spirit, they are the sons of Elohim. So the resurrection is to pave the way for sons of Elohim. That's why he told them, I go to my father, I go to go and tell my brethren, because we are now have the full liberty to become and to live and to manifest as the sons of Elohim. And when we manifest it all over the world, let it be one thing the Lord will do through this COVID-19 that sons of Elohim emerge worldwide, neither male nor female. Because if you read Galatians 3, 26 to 29, sonship speaks of maturity in the Lord. It speaks of coming to a place of total dependency on Him. It speaks of a place of submitting your will and picking up the will of the Father. It comes to a place of being totally yielded. Being totally invested, seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. And then the Father will commit to such people the awesome authority to take charge of the atrium assigned to them. And they are living for him, not for themselves, not for their belly. Let this be the transitioning that will take place today and on the days to come. So that by the time we come to Pentecost Sunday, a massive number of intercessors and brethren across the world will have this testimony. That the Lord blessed them with the gift of Holy Spirit. And not just speaking in tongues. That in everything they began to live by Holy Spirit. So that by the time the lockdowns are lifted. And by the time you know things are across the earth rim clear. The whole world will see the awesome manifestation of sons of Elohim. And we will collectively do the last lap of the gospel program. Taking the gospel to all nations making sure that there is a manifestation of divinity anywhere we are and doing that with all passion so that the end shall come and that day of the trumpet by the power that same Holy Spirit that raised Yeshua from the dead he seal upon us both those of us who are alive now and those who are dead that seal will quicken us and we the dead will rise first resurrected and we will be raptured the resurrection of Yeshua guarantees our rapture and the resurrection for those who are dead. It guarantees that as it was with him, that's what 1 Corinthians 15 says, and I urge you to read 1 Corinthians 15 today and understand the theology of the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, we love you dearly, and we're going to pray now and then I'll make some announcements. Father in heaven, thank you for your word that has gone forth. I pray in a special way that the Holy Spirit will come upon the church afresh and there will be a massive outpouring. My father, I'm not talking about all those cosmetic things. I'm talking about the real deal that 
brethren will yearn for hunger, for passion, for young and old. And they'll pray and press in. And you'll feel all who are in Yeshua. And there will be a powerful manifestation of the Omega Church filled with Holy Spirit. Or walking in the power of Holy Spirit and doing the end time work. To finish the work. Before the day appointed for the sound of the trumpet, representing the Father, taking responsibility for his business in the earth rim. And Father, separated from this world and the spirit that rules the world, no space for the spirit of the world to come upon your remnant. Lord, do it for your name's sake. I pray that this hunger shall be activated right now in everyone hearing this and all those who will hear later. Let your name be glorified. Do it for your name's sake. That we will live the resurrected life above sin above Satan, above everything that is negative. And therefore, your name will be exalted in us. Thank you for answering our prayer. We give you all praise, all glory, all worship, all adoration, now and forevermore in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Wonderful, happy resurrection day. I don't use any of those religious terms. Easter, I don't use them. What do they mean? Resurrection is what I know. And I urge you to be radical about these things. Some bad days today, our sister, Apostle Lori Olga, in the, who labors among the native uh, tribes of Canada, today is a bad day. And also, our brother, Apostle Stephen Muller King in South Africa, today is his bad day. And others like our sister, Martha Mike and Eric Matsanza and Wanda Ross, River Honey, uh, and Connor Moisea, these bad days are today. And you know what, brothers and sisters, the five-day remnant Passover fast ends today. I believe that a lot of the remnant are going to press into a new relationship with the Lord in Holy Spirit. So the Lord bless you with resurrection power. And I pray that testimonies will begin to ring. If the Lord did something major for you, don't hold it back. Whether on the prayer line or Facebook group, you know what? Share it. And can you invite some other people to join us on the 24-7 prayer line? And if you want to know the line, you can ask questions. If you're asking from your country, we will give it to you on, your, on this uh, thread. And also, in the Facebook group, you can invite people to join the Global Prayer Task Force to degrade and combat coronavirus. Let's have more people right now. There are about seven or something people, which is awesome. But supposing we have a thousand people or more. Praying, tearing the heavens. That would be wonderful. So tomorrow, we go to our normal prayers concerning degradation and elimination of coronavirus. So tomorrow, we go back to them today. Eat, drink, after you break your fast, and rejoice in what the Lord has done and what he will yet do for you. We love you dearly. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I wish we had my chauffeur right now to blow for you. And you know what? The Lord is gracious, is merciful, is plenteous in his grace towards us. He loves us. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.